Well, man, this is an honor. This is, it's been a long time since I've been a guest on a Stan the Fan show. That's, uh, that's almost never happened. You mean a Stan the Fan show brought to you by AJ Michaels, Heating and Air Conditioning, Superbook Sports, and the Costas Inn? I love all of those places. I'm so glad that's who brings us the Stan the Fan show because I am a fan of all of those establishments. Glenn, tell me, how did the Costas Inn get that publicity s- Sunday during the game? Where they came back during a commercial. That was unbelievable. I, I have a guess about who was involved with that. I think there's someone from this area that we all know that is involved with CBS. Okay. Um, that is friends with the folks at Costas Inn. But because I don't know it, yep. I don't want to say that. But it's there's a half a chance that he's he's listening or watching us right now. Okay. So, hey, RD, if it, was, if it was you, let us know. Because, you know, you're our guy. We love you. It was and, great. Yeah, it was awesome. That it was, was Really, really cool to see. That was the best moment of the game. As well. <laughs> it really was, wasn't it, Stan? It really was. All right, Glenn Clark, Stan the Fan Charles, Luke Jackson with you. Obviously, the, the news has been kind of fast and furious this week in Baltimore. Um, we had decided to do this because we wanted to powwow about the uh, the, the last story. Um, we'll have plenty of time to talk about Mike McDonald this week and whoever the Ravens replace him with as defensive coordinator. But um, the story du jour is, of course, the um, it, I'd say it's the reported sale, but I, I think it's safe to say it, it's, we know. It's, yeah, it's happening. Yeah. yeah, it's it's the real deal uh, of the Orioles to uh, David Rubenstein or David Rubenstein, I believe it is, and his group. So. Stan, I'll start with you. I know you wrote a little bit about, um, you know, some of your reflections of past Orioles sales uh, today at PressBoxOnline.com. But I'll let you start, like, your initial reaction as this was unfolding last night and sort of your feelings about the next steps of the Baltimore Orioles. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty amazing story. Uh, how quickly this came about when you, you know, you know the expression where there's smoke, there's fire. And there was definitely the smoke of uh, the rumor from Bloomberg back in early December about uh, David Rubenstein being interested in buying the Orioles. And then there was all the the machinations about, no, the the Angelos family isn't selling them. Then you hear that they're reported together at lunch down in Washington. uh, And then nothing. And then suddenly, all of a sudden, at 6 o'clock, my cousin Ron Matz, called me and said, hey, the Orioles are being sold. So it was it was a lot to digest very quickly while I was preparing my dinner uh, last night. And uh, it was an excellent was dinner, was, I was going to say, was dinner still good? Or? It was an excellent salad. It okay. was an incredible salad. I'm glad chicken. to hear it. So, so it was uh, a lot to digest. I mean, look, I got mixed emotions. I was not a huge fan of Peter's. Uh, but I know he had some great qualities, uh, and his family had some great qualities. John, I thought, I, I don't really get the disdain that Baltimore fans hold towards him, because to me, as I put in my column, the only crime he committed was he didn't have his dad's checkbook to to finish the deal. But he did the most important thing a baseball executive can do to me an owner can do is hire a good person and get the hell out of the way. And I think that that will be John's endearing legacy is he did something that his father was totally incapable of doing, which was not injecting himself into the DNA of formulating baseball decisions. And for that, I think the Oriole fans are really poised to get what they deserve finally which is an ownership that is both committed and smart. And not I'm not saying that Peter Angelos was dumb because uh, he's got a couple billion reasons more than me that show that he's smart. But I think he just couldn't take himself out of knowing more than his baseball people. And John was smart enough from watching his dad and seeing the how wrong that is because baseball people – are smart about baseball because they've done it all that time. So that's my initial thoughts is this is a win for baseball fans. And of course, the Angelos family made an incredible 
amount of money owning the Baltimore. Orioles. Yeah, that part for sure. Yeah. Luke, before I come to you, I, I want to follow up on two things that Stan said, if I could, because uh, it was a hell of an interesting night to be doing live radio in Baltimore uh, for, for sure. Um, I I said immediately, I was sitting uh, over at 105.7 last night and I was sitting in our program director, Chuck Sapienza's office at the same time, Stan, when we all got this news. And I said, I, I think I, what I don't like is I think there will be people that will treat this like Dan Snyder selling the commanders. And it ain't that. No. Dan Snyder was vile. Dan Snyder was evil. Dan Snyder was incompetent. Um, and and I get there will that- be there will be no lawsuits by Oriole employees against Peter Angelos ever. He was an incredible boss. As much as I had my problems with him, he was incredibly loyal to the family that was the Baltimore Orioles. So, so I. I- to, to follow up on two things you said, yeah, I understand your sentiment about John Angelos. And I think you know about me that I was always inclined to give John, you know, every ounce of opportunity to show I'm not my father. Yeah. And one of the reasons why it bothered me to people and it got, dives into what's next in comparing it to the commander's situation, the commander's cupboard is empty. The Orioles, if you're celebrating the ownership change, you're forgetting the fact that they won 101 games with this last ownership year. Group Correct. With John Angelos. Right. Show. And yep. and laid a foundation that is very real and meaningful. And if you want to dismiss John Angelos and say, well, that's all Mike Elias, okay, but who hired Mike Elias to your point? Yep. I, I do think that some of the reflections about John and, and, fair or unfair john always had to a lot of people made the comparison to the chicago blackhawks and what their ownership group did was so well at every turn understood we're being measured against my father i I need to everything i say i need to be careful and present a different look john unfortunately quite publicly a couple of times stubbed his toe significantly yeah and because he was always you know like he had to climb up to be viewed fairly those public stubbings of the toe really ended up being unfortunate for him and i think painted the picture of why orioles fans were less inclined to give john the opportunity i would agree with that that's a Um, point well made but it is incredibly important to recognize that from a baseball standpoint the Orioles are in good position. They're in great position. I don't know that I disagree yeah. with that, right? Yeah. Like, I, I do worry that maybe they might be behind on trying to do extensions and the clock might be a problem. But for, from from sheerly what the foundation that's there, they're in a great spot. Agreed yeah. with that. Yeah. I, moving forward, if I have a concern, and part of the reason why I'm not yet saying I'm going to celebrate <clears throat> the news of the sale is – I need to hear David Rubenstein say, I recognize what's going on in Baltimore. I I want to build on that. And a lot of wealthy people, even successful wealthy people, are inclined to say, I want to do my own thing. I want my own people to be in charge. I want to have my own stamp on something. I've talked to um, our friend Marty Conway, and I've talked to a couple other people that know David Rubenstein who have said, I don't think there's any chance that that's what he's going to do as owner of the Baltimore Orioles. I just need to hear that from him. I just need David Rubenstein to walk in and say, I believe in the foundation that the Orioles have. I just want to add to it. I just just want, want, I just want to say, I I think listening to him say that is one thing. It's sure. The test is in watching how he operates. And I just don't think a 73 or 74 year old billionaire who asked one of his buddies, who's also a billionaire, I don't think they came into this saying, hey, let's go there and we can pinch pennies and do this and that. I think they are coming in here to to really, really just put a, their stamp on it will be that they took it over the finish line. I am inclined. Yeah, Yeah. I'm inclined to agree with you, Stan, and I think that's, it obviously is the hope. I'm inclined to think that's true, but to your point, yes, I need to hear him say it, and then I need to see the actions that back that up. I just wish it it would have happened before Yamamoto signed with the, uh, you know. That would have been nice. nice. Luke Jackson, your, uh, your initial reaction. 
Well, I think you're absolutely right, Glenn. This is a great time to buy the Baltimore Orioles. Number one, you have no payroll commitments in the future. And so you have a totally blank slate uh, in terms of that. You have a lot of young talent at your disposal. Um, However, uh, there are some challenges that will still uh, be present uh, when he takes over. They they move into the AL Central. Um, This is a highly competitive division. Those challenges will remain the same. And a lot of their direct competitors have access to a lot more revenue streams than the Orioles do. And I think one of the things that I'll be interested in uh, hearing from uh, Rubenstein, uh, whenever, whenever it comes is, you know, his, what his ideas he has in terms of Masson, you know, mm-hmm. I think that that has turned into a bit of an issue at this point over the past several years. Yep. Um, I don't, I don't know what the financial situation of Masson is. You guys would probably have a much better idea on that than me. Um, uh, the, and, the subscriber number is down by like 2 million. Yeah. So I don't know if it's years. a situation where it's like bleeding money or something, but I think there will be a uh, long-term si- uh, solution needed uh, for the uh, local TV situation with the Orioles and Nats and how that's going to work. Uh, and that's going to be key in the revenue that they bring in. And also, you know, you look around baseball and a lot of owners and John Angelos wanted to do this as well. Uh, it's a real estate deal around the uh, around the ballpark, right? And owners use that to bring in more revenue. I think Rubenstein is going to have to figure out a way, and obviously he's got a lot more capital on hand than John Angelos did, but he's also going to have some challenges in terms of figuring figuring out how do we bring in more revenue and that sort of thing. So, and there are some different ways you can do that, uh, but I think that those will be challenges that he'll have to tackle as well. But I think, yeah, I think that the biggest thing that Orioles fans want is now they feel, I think Orioles fans feel like there is a real chance that this club can stick together long-term. And before that was the, like the missing piece, right? Glenn, you've written about this ad nauseum, right? And, and deservedly so that the the elephant in the room is how long are these guys going to stick together? Yep. And I think Orioles fans probably feel a lot better about the chances that that happens uh, than they did, you know, six months ago. So let me let me follow up on two things, too. And then, Stan, I'll, I'll go to you with this, because, Luke, what you just said, one of the things I warned about today, I, I'm still worried. I'm worried that because Adley Rutschman is only one year away from arbitration mm-hmm. and we don't know exactly when like we're assuming at this point, it'll be before the season that this will move rapidly, that David Rubenstein takes over. But still, he's only a year away from real money coming in. I don't know how what the appetite will be for Adley Rutschman's camp at this point, two years in, to try yeah, to do an also, extension. Yeah, and he also signed for nearly $10 million. Correct. So. so it's not like he's made no money, right? Like, And then I add to that that we all know that the difficulty of the others is they're Scott Boris clients. Right. right. And so if the measurement of David Rubenstein and his group is, do you lock these guys up? that might prove to be an unfair way mm-hmm. to measure this. Like I, I do think we still need to be realistic that no owner is walking in and just for funsies saying, let me give Gunnar Henderson $600 million right, tomorrow. Right. No one's doing that. And I think the point, Luke, and, and Stan, I'll follow up on it. I think we've all been in agreement. No one's ever expected that the Baltimore Orioles will become the Los Angeles Dodgers, or the, the New York Yankees or something, or the Mets. I think the idea is just this off season. It would have been nice for there to have been a commitment to more than one player for ten million dollars, right? Like that. I, I think that there's a happy medium somewhere in between those things. And if you continue with Mike Elias to draft and develop, and the work that's been done in international scouting, and and how much you've caught up in those areas, it doesn't require you to be the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Mets, one of those types of spenders. And and, and I don't think the I, the notion that they're going to sign Rutschman, Henderson, and Holiday all long-term is really realistic. And I, I think the club is poised in a much different position than when Manny Machado was approaching it. And it was like all of a sudden when it became apparent they, they couldn't sign him, that they just sort of like, well, well, we'll get rid of them for this and this and this and this. And there was nothing coming beyond that. When you hear when you hear a guy like our prospects expert, Eric Garfield, talk about Sammy Basayo, 
being a guy that yep. could potentially be another number one prospect. Suddenly, do I want to lose Rutschman? No, I don't. But the idea of maybe trading Rutschman in a year and a half and getting a a real, you know, a king's ransom for him with Basayo proven that he's just about ready is also quite capable of being the reality. I think that's the idea. The idea is you're building the, keep this structure in place. Yeah. Keep drafting well, keep developing, keep the international focus, signing there, keep all of that structure in place with the ability to add to it, with the yeah. ability to do the thing that we've asked for, which is just adding another pitcher, adding one more bat, perhaps being more aggressive at the trade deadline because you're not afraid of of thirty million dollars that are left on someone's deal over the course of the next two years, and, I mean, and also it, it would allow you to be more aggressive in the sense that I can give up prospects A, B, and C because I'm more willing to go out in the free agent market and quote unquote replace them that way as yeah. necessary. A hundred percent. I, I, I think mean, it became that, obvious watching this off season that after they they did the fix to make sure we had a closer, that there was very little cash on hand that they were willing to put into play to really put this team in a great position to succeed this year. They're still in a good position to succeed. Mm -hmm. but they could have been in a great position to really challenge for a world series. I, I, this is, you know, I think this is the appropriate level of excitement. It's the, I, Sam, what you just, if you think this is, there's about to be a billion dollars spent on this core of baseball players. I, I would pump the brakes. Yeah. I, I I would on both ends. I just don't think that's the way they're going to view this. I don't think that these players are as easily signable at this point as we want them to it's be. It's two way street. Yep. Yeah. Look, and you don't and t and you tend not to uh, hire Scott Boris in order to take team friendly deals. That's yeah. not how why you hire Scott Boris. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people uh, who are Colt Keith right in Detroit this week just got they, six years, twenty eight million dollars. I can tell you who his agent is not. I can and, tell you that. And yeah. it would never happen with Scott Boris because he would say you're potentially leaving money on the table in this process, right? Like you're taking money up front that if, if you're the guy everybody thinks you are, you're going to get all that money in arbitration down the road. Like what are we doing? Why? Why, why would we do that? Scott yeah. Boris isn't interested in that type of deal. You know, the yeah. thing also just to remind people, though, about Peter Angelos is Peter Angelos was not cheap. When Peter Angelos took over the Orioles, he opened his checkbook to pretty widely. What what where Peter lost it was his inability to be consistent and let the baseball people. I know I'm saying the same thing again. You got Pat Gillick, the most respected executive in the game, and somehow because Pat Gillick was wrong one time, you suddenly said, you know, he doesn't know that much. So what is the point yeah, of of showing up your general manager when he's still one of the best in the game? And maybe he made a wrong decision on trading Bobby Bonilla that year, you know, wanting to trade Bonilla when they did make the playoffs. Uh, but but he was willing to spend, but he his temperament was such that he checked in for a while, then he checked out for a while, and he just didn't have the consistency that you need out of an owner. It's hard to imagine David Rubenstein not possessing that consistency. I, I also think um, it's relevant. I, I hope that the sign, like, you know, and whatever the percentage is, the Cal Ripken is involved. I don't know. I hope it's a sign of one of the priorities of the ownership is going to be the things that stand. We have talked so much in the last couple of years that it, it doesn't really mean anything when you put Eddie Murray up on the screen or you put Brooks, but it means so much on a, on a dumb, you know, purely kind of esoteric level to baseball fans to know that there are open relationships between the organization and the legends. And no question about it. No I, I, about it. I hope that that's part of this is showing a priority and showing deference to that. And we want that to be known on day one that 
we're not asking for fealty. We're not, we just, we, I hope that's what that is. I can't speak to that yet. It's another thing we're going to have to learn yeah. as this ownership grow, group grows on. And I think the Orioles, obviously, you know, Bill Steck and his team did a tremendous job of trying to make that work, but there were just some high profile instances where those relationships were far frostier than you would have ever preferred them to to be no for a fan base and the legends of the team. So I hope no question about it. that that's part of the reason why they were inclined to want to have Cal Ripken be part of this group yep. is to make that statement. Send that message. Yeah, this is, this is equivalent. I don't know how, how much Cal's going to have invested right. or whether it's more a figurehead, but this is like a big time Brooks Robinson is still young enough to really participate and be out there and an ambassador for the club. Yep. And I would hope that they would want to pick his ear from time to time. But Michael Elias and Sig Meidel have done a pretty good job. 100%. They're, yeah. they're running the baseball show, and they should run the baseball yeah. show. And that's I keep coming back to that, Stan, to your point about Peter Angelos. It's the people are in place. We believe in this group. And we're past the part where, well, hey, anybody could have drafted Adley Rutschman. Well, not, anybody could have drafted Gunnar Henderson, literally, and no one did. Right. Like, let's let's have the real conversation now. Every team had the opportunity to draft Gunnar Henderson. Nobody did that. And they had the opportunity to draft Kobe Mayo. A hundred percent. Right. Felix Batista was not a number one overall pick in a draft. We have enough evidence at this point to know that it's more than just they're capable of picking the right guy at number one overall. There is a real thing going on. Bolden it. Like, come back and say, hey, we can, we will, you want to build another academy? Let's build another academy somewhere. We love the one, now, where do we want to go next? Where's the next place where we want to go build an academy and improve our scouting? I, those are the types of, add to, it's a yes and proposition. What you're doing is great. How do we, how do we make it better? How do we make it better? How do we strengthen the foundation that's already here? Yep. What about non-baseball wise? What would you be your priorities, Luke? You brought up uh, Masson, obviously, I, and I, it's a it's it seems silly, but like one of the first things I need to know is that I can stream the baseball games moving yeah. forward. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, but yeah, untangling uh, Masson as a long-term solution, and Stan would have a much better idea than me about how that's all going to go. It seemed to me that. Uh, this ownership group uh, might have missed the boat on maybe selling Masson when the RSN bubble was at its peak for back in like the 2014, 2015 range. Um, and, and at this point, it's a little bit of a mess. Uh, so, yeah, I think that that's the biggest one. And the other thing is that the, the lease was just signed. And one of the uh, things in the lease is that I think it's in four years, the state has to see plans about what the club wants to do with the land that I guess is assigned or uh, for development around the park. What does the new ownership group want to do with that land? Uh, what what kind of plans do they have? Well, I'm sure they have some ideas. Uh, but uh, so I think that those are you know two big things uh, that that come to mind immediately. What comes of those two things? Stan, what about you? Beside the baseball front, I think that that whole blueprint down at the ballpark is going to be fascinating to see what somebody like. David Rubenstein and his partner and and the other investors they have in their group. You know, supposedly they have a number of local people that are putting some money into this thing uh, and the power of really helping to change downtown uh, and making people feel safer about coming downtown. You and know, the other thing I guess we're... would say, would be that, you know, the state has allocated $600 million to improve Camden Yards. Yep. Yeah. And I don't know when Rubenstein's going to take over for good, but, you know, I think that that's going to be one of his first orders of business too, figuring out much like the Ravens have done where yeah, that's going to take, that's yeah. going to take six, eight months from the yeah. time that Rubenstein takes yeah. over. And by the way, you alluded to it, Glenn, I think this is going to move pretty quickly yeah. because I think major league baseball once, you know, I, I think that John got along very well with the commissioner, uh, but I think they want to move this along and put this club in the hands of somebody else running it from a day to day. Here's one. If I, I, I would not be surprised if in the foreseeable future, meaning the next several years, an all star game comes to Baltimore mm. with this. Oh, I don't think there's any question about mm. that. That'll be mm. here in the next three or four years. I hadn't even thought about it. And what about, what about here's, an, here's an idea. 
what if David Rubenstein comes in and they, they name the press box after Jim Henneman? <laughs> I like I that idea. That's a great idea, Stan. Like that idea. Awesome. I'm in favor, I'm in favor of that idea one. Anyone's had so far. But wow, yeah. man, that could be the last moment. Think about it. that. Could be the last moment of an ownership group, yeah. right? And <laughs> hey. then they they take it over and name it after somebody else. Nah, I don't think so. Not I think that happen. one. I not think gonna that one's going to stick. That's gonna um, stick. Uh, both the, to both of those points, right? I, I, it's funny, Stan. I remember <clears> when you and I. We're like literally one day just looking at a map and trying to figure out where there might be actual space. Yeah. The point that Luke made about David Rubenstein actually having the capital, this is interesting because, of course, John Angelos was looking for it to just be gifted to right. him. Just just right. give it to me. Whereas David Rubenstein might say, hey, if we can get a little bit of space, you know, land that was given to us and then combine that with the pockets that I have and what I'm willing to do to try to further develop the area around the ballpark, that might be interesting. It's, it's not. Uh, to, to me, the, the, it's got to be a public private partnership that takes you from the Hippodrome theater down Utah street. Okay. And that is a safe zone to park in and be in and, and, you know, shuttles going back and forth to your car, to the stadium, uh, bars to watch the games at. It, it, it's got it's got the earmarks of being a perfect location. There isn't enough land around the ballpark. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a couple blocks away, you know. And to the point, I, it might be that perhaps David Rubenstein is more interested in saying, hey, what does it take to get this done? Yeah. And, and if I've got to be involved with that, let me be involved with that because that is the well, way see, that that'll make be, this work. That'll be one of the most interesting things about this uh, is is how he approaches that. I think. And, and to the point about Masson, I, I think the reality at this point is that we all know that like cable TV networks are going to be gone within right. a decade. They're dinosaurs. They're the, dinosaurs. Like, that so network I, has become kind of a pain in the ass, right, for them? Um. I, I would think there's still a little bit of money being made okay. on certain things, but it's it's minimal. It's it's right. certainly not. I, it's I, no I, longer what it was intended to be, which was the the equalizer right. between Baltimore and Washington. You know, right. Uh, it took a lot of attendance away from the the Nationals moving into Washington. Did take a lot of fans away mm -hmm. from Camden Yards. Now, to his part. Peter Angelos, the way he ran the team for those 14 years where they couldn't figure their way out of last did place. Did the same. That did, yep. that did the same thing, too. So I, I would say that maybe whatever that looks like, if it's a if it's just a mass and app in the future, but, like, you know, it's functional. It, yep. it, it works. You can actually stream the game. It's a small thing that I'm asking for. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it should be too much, but I, I'm not. Uh, you know what? We're not we're not here to rain on the parade. I guess let's continue that route. Um, All right. Anything else that you guys want to get in before we wrap up? No, I think that, I think we've touched on everything. Luke, anything on your part? That you want to no, I think we we sort of touched on everything that we could based on the details that we know at this point. Yep. Yep. Lots still to be learned. We're, we're learning more and more about folks that are involved um, in in this ownership group. But once I mean, once upon a time, you know, Pam Shriver and Tom Clancy and folks like that were involved in the ownership group. There will be Barry more and Levinson, more. Steve yep. Jeppe, yep. Wayne Giosa, a lot of we're, Jim McKay, I think, was involved at one point. We're seeing uh, what Grant Hill is going to be involved with this ownership group, and uh, former Mayor Kurt Schmoke is involved with this ownership group, and there'll be more names. He went to City College with uh, That's That's with, right. Uh, I think, I, think I saw maybe Michael Phelps might be in this ownership group wow. so wow. um we'll see more and more names like that but yeah until until we hear from david rubenstein Colson involved i don't think john made the cut unfortunately yeah. which is a real shame because i would like to see goose flights lager served at oriole park at camden yards next week that would really make me quite happy if everybody could get their goose flights lager there but in the meantime guilford hall brewery costa sin Wine source. I picked the Glory Days back. Grill. Very, it's, very it's delicious. A, beer. It's a delicious beer. It is a, a delicious, delicious beer. beer. Let's and get a, some of that sold out. Yep. A great cause is obviously we're uh, partnered up with the, the Goose Flights Foundation and providing non emergency medical transport to those that are in need. And Glenn, I'll just point before we leave Stan Charles 23, Glenn Clark 23. Those are the promo codes for Superbook Sports. If you haven't signed up for a, uh, 
a betting partner or you want to add another one because you haven't had good luck at uh, the other ones, uh, Superbook is offering a $250 first bet match, win or lose, if you use those promo codes. Stan Charles 23 and uh, Clark 23. Guys, as we, are, as we are prepared to wrap up, there has been a news release from David Rubenstein. Okay. So uh, I, I don't have the whole thing in front of me. This is Hayes Gardner, the Baltimore Sun, uh, bringing up a couple of points. A uh, news release from David Rubenstein spokesperson says, uh, A, Rubenstein will become control person of the Orioles. Angelo's family will, quote, continue as a major investor, unquote. And then John Angelos will work with Rubenstein as a senior advisor, which was something that, you know, I, I had speculated about a little bit if that was part of how we, this made was made to happen and could allow John to continue pursuing some of these other things that he's been interested in. I, I've always thought, and, and the, the one I point to is the Frank McCourt, when they forced him out of, out of Los Angeles, you know, it's 10 years later since McCourt had to sell the Dodgers major league baseball, force him out. He still controls the parking lots. Uh, I'm not suggesting John Angelos wants to control the parking lots, but maybe his deal is I'm going to be the entertainment purveyor for the ballpark sure so. sure um that would go a long way i am um i'm hey you know what i've got it here here we go okay this is the statement uh the angeles family majority owner of the Ma of major league baseball franchise the baltimore orioles has agreed to sell a control stake in the orioles to baltimore native philanthropist and investor david rubenstein for 1.725 billion dollars the Angelos family will continue to hold a sizable investment in the Orioles, and John Angelos will serve as a senior advisor to the organization. The transaction is subject to review and approval by MLB's ownership committee and a full vote of MLB ownership. Um, uh, here's a statement from John Angelos, quote, when I took on the role of chair and CEO of the Orioles, we had the objective of restoring the franchise to elite status in major league sports, keeping the team in Baltimore for years to come and revitalizing our partnership group. This relationship with David Rubenstein and his partners validates that we have not only met, but exceeded our goals, unquote. Great quote. So, Great quote. And, and you, you can't really poke a hole at that, can you? Um, no. No. You really, you really can't. So these these things have a way. I'll never forget when uh, when uh, when Bill DeWitt. I think Bill DeWitt was actually the, when the Orioles won the auction, the bankruptcy auction for the Orioles. Bill DeWitt had become a partner of Peter Angelos's, and as soon as Angelos owned the team, suddenly Bill DeWitt was gone. And a year later, two years later, he owned the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, wouldn't surprise me if that's said for the purpose of, of, of today. And maybe a year from now, John will be divested. But there's also the possibility that they do want to keep him around, which I think would be great. Uh, uh, one more statement from Angelos, and then we actually have a statement from Rubenstein. John Angelos, quote, I am personally committed to helping David and his partners take the franchise to the next level. We think this transaction is great for Major League Baseball and great for the city of Baltimore and Maryland. And then from David Rubenstein, quote, I look forward to working with all the Orioles owners, players and staff to build upon the incredible success the team has achieved in recent seasons. Our collective goal will be to bring a World Series trophy back to the city of Baltimore. That sounds great to me, man. Yeah, that's uh, if you're going to make a first statement, that's not a bad first statement to make. Build upon. There's a foundation. We want to build upon it. We want to win a World Series. Use the words World Series. Say those words. State that is the goal. Now, we're going to measure you against that goal, but state that goal. That's what people are asking for. All right, I'll let uh, Luke go. Make sure we get that up on the website. <laughs> I'll All let, right. uh, I'll All let right. that happen at PressBoxOnline.com. Good to get together with you guys. Appreciate it, guys. I'll be on tomorrow talking prospects with uh, Eric Garfield. I think I said 3.30, Luke. Did I say that? I don't know, man. It's your show. Okay. All right. You were producing it for me tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I'll be here whenever you want me. All right. It'll All be 3.30 right. or 4 o'clock tomorrow. And uh, I will see you on Friday morning, Stan Charles. Look forward okay. to it. Look forward to it. Bye oh, guys. Buster only joins me tomorrow, so he can probably take a victory lap on uh, Glenn Clark. Great. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a great segment, man. Yeah. See you guys. Appreciate right. it. Bye.